Hello everyone and welcome to the Nowness 10th Anniversary Festival, a day of talks, screenings and workshops, supporting and inspired by exceptional filmmaking talent. It's my pleasure to introduce the wonderful Luca Guadagnino. Luca, hello. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you. Um, I've been immersed in We Are Who We Are all week. Thank you for bringing us this incredible story. Without giving too much away, can you give us a quick synopsis, the director's framing of the story? Absolutely. Thank you for your kind words on the show. I mean, it's been a great journey for me. First time I did, a, I, I made an endeavor for TV. I, I was a, a, a always skeptical about me doing TV and eventually I did it. Uh, we are, we are, it's, it's mostly a story of families and a story of individuals. And uh, it's about uh, two wonderful kids, uh, uh, Fraser and Caitlin, and their friendship and the way this friendship protects one another. But at the same time, it's about how these kids live within the boundaries of two families, uh, of American families, of military American families living within the confines of, um, of, um, of an American military base abroad, in this case, in, in the outskirts of Chioggia in Veneto, Italy. Um, you'll, in the show, you, you follow not only Fraser and Caitlin, but all their friends and the, the, the members of the family, the mothers, the father, and the, uh, let's say, the lovers or the, what they feel could be lovers until basically uh, we we'll learn what they really want, maybe for until then. Well, let's start with the title, We Are Who We Are. I mean, it immediately puts us into a conversation about identity, yes. and particularly non-conforming identities. Um, and the core of the film is really about each of the characters' journeys of transformation. Um, so we're closely observing the changes in who they are and who they're becoming. And I just wanted to ask you about these adolescents who are kind of in a coming of age moment, um, which is a part of what we're seeing. And then so many of those other um, identity shifts that happen in the story through gender, gender and through non-conforming identities. I mean, what is the, what is the, um, I've heard you talk about your, your the, the way that adolescents is something that you're very attracted to in terms of filmmaking and storytelling. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, I, I, I thank you so much because you, you got to straight to the point by saying that we are who we are is about identity. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, uh, um, it precisely tries to focus on how we make our identity change constantly throughout what we fear and desire, wish for ourselves. Adolescence in itself is a shifting age. You are mourning the loss of, of childhood and you are not yet fully an adult. And in the meantime, your body is changing dramatically uh, and, and, and you don't know how to control this uh, shift and this storm of change that uh, you, uh, crosses your body, your mind, your, your, your heart. And in this sense, uh, in a way, it's hyper -cinema, cinematic because cinema is all about uh, um, how to, to, to grasp the mystery of, of, of life and change. You, uh, say, but you, I, said, you said hyper cinematic? Is that what you yes, said? Oh, yes. I, I, I believe that, uh, I do believe that uh, because the center of the show is about adolescence, uh, I also feel that even the adults are kind of adolescents. I mean, our generations are, and the younger ones, of course, are in a way at loss with the dealing with the idea of being adult. Uh, in a way, we are still trying to grasp the possibility of, 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 of being young. And in fact, um, Sarah and Maggie and Jenny and Richard and, and, Tom and Jonathan, those adults in the show, somehow are as lost as, at loss as the kids in the show. Absolutely. And that's like, touching and, and, and beautiful to observe. Well, it's interesting because they're as in flux. Um, it's not just the teenagers who are coming of age that are in flux. The adults are in a space or in a, in a, in a process of transformation as well, because they're also all changing, you know, or shifting. Um, and I think this is incredible, really, in this, in, in this way as a sort of a group portrait. 
um, it's a it's 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 very wonderful and i think um you know another core tenant in the film you talked about this military base in venice which is you know i guess like american military bases all over the world they're kind of little america right and uh this idea in this film and this notion of displacement and juxtaposition is interesting the idea of a clashing of cultures and ideas through displacement so you have these Americans in Little America in Italy. Then you have obviously the displacement of the teenagers being in this militarized context. And they're, they're just kids that are in high school, but they're in the base. Then the commander and wife, you talked about Chloe Sevigny's character and, and, um, and, and her wife played by- is Elisa it? Braga. Elisa Braga. They're displaced as queer soldiers in the military. And then, you know, can you talk about this theme that I've picked up on on displacement and if it was something that was, was core for you, juxtaposition and displacement? I recently realized that many of my work uh, has been uh, revolving around displacement, uh, uh, around someone who was not belonging to the place in which we, ca we, we have been uh, wow. catching them. Mm. Um, this probably uh, uh, is because I myself has been displaced. I, I grew up in Ethiopia from a mother that is Algerian and a father that is Italian. And then I moved from place to place. Um, Hang on a I minute. Like... You're, you're skirting over something extremely interesting there, Luca. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about this background that you just mentioned. So my what? mother is Algerian and yeah. she met my father when she was uh, uh, growing up in Morocco uh, in, in the, during the late 60s. And my dad um, and her um, had a sort of, they, they ran away from the country. They got was married. Was that in some kind of civil dispute in the country or? or? No, I think uh, that it was a, a sort of... Uh, um, uh, a, a, a love that couldn't be uh, carried in Morocco, so they had to go in. They actually, they actually went to Scotland, where they married, and and then they had my sister, then my brother, and then me. And then when I was born in August 1971, um, they where moved were you born? in Palermo, in Sicily, in 1971, and they moved to Ethiopia, where my dad had. Um, he was a professor, my my father, so he was going to teach there. And we moved there and I spent like six years in Ethiopia. So yeah. basically I grew up in Ethiopia. I started my sense of life there, um, coming from two different uh, identities. One is the, uh, an Arab identity and the other one is an Italian one, a European one. So again, to tie this up with the, we are who we are, I feel that displacement is something that uh, clearly attracts me. And probably because I I am I have a sense of direct empathy with someone who somehow doesn't know what where he or she or they belong, and eventually they adapt. Um, and the military in itself is a world where you must adapt. You can't mm. bring your uh, let's say individualness to it. You have to conform to the group. But what I love about the uh, military world, having studied a lot and having met a lot of people that live in this life, is that even if, of course, military life is about the, the collective endeavor of a group of people who are there to make, uh, uh, protect you or make the war or whatever, it's wonderful to see in the one-to-one -one experience how many different identities are within this conformity. And that is, I guess, somehow, the way in which we are trying to, to not to use, I don't want to use the word use, but to frame the world, uh, the, the story of these people in this uh, specific context. Because in a way, for its very specificity, I believe the military world, somehow it's a beautiful paradig paradigm of the universality. Um, more than, let's say, setting the story in uh, generic suburbia. Um, no, it's much more extreme. It's much more extreme, and then it kind it of is. Yes. It, 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 it kind of puts everything else in much more sharp relief. And um, I want to come on to talk to you a bit more about the the the, the military base, and then the, the kind of U.S. election, the 2018 election that's building up in the background. But um, I, I want to focus on the characters for a second and ask you about, or hopefully more than a second. But I love Caitlin and Fraser. I really, I really adore these characters because, and they're wonderfully played by, by Jordan Christine Simone and, and Jack Dylan um, Grazer. 
and they're, they're very complex characters um but they're wonderfully they're wonderfully acted by those by those two talents can we talk about jordan for a minute this is her screen debut um and she's a phenomenal presence captivating from the minute she appears on the screen can you introduce us to her character and tell us a bit about what it was like working with um jordan yeah, Absolutely. The, 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 the writers, uh, Francesca Manieri and Paolo Giordano, who wrote the show, um, and I, we had created the, uh, uh, the character of Caitlin as uh, the perfect example of, of, of a person that come from mixed cultures, but also uh, a total in displacement. She's the daughter of a Nigerian woman and an American man. She, she kind of never stayed stabilized in a place because the family moves constantly through from base to base. She's in this moment in which she wants to become, she's going to become a woman. She has her period in the second episode and, and she, she becomes a woman. Uh, she's 14 in, at the beginning of the story. But at the same time, she kind of start of uh, ask herself whether she identifies as, as a girl or as a boy as a female or, a, or as a male or as anything. Mm. And, 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 and only by having uh, uh, met Fraser, she starts to somehow uh, carry with great uh, uh, um, elan and with great uh, happiness all the complexities that she feels because Fraser doesn't judge her at, at the, at the, at the, on the opposite, he empowers her. Um, when we wrote the character, it was so difficult to conceive a real life embodiment of it because, I mean, we had to really uh, find someone who could be all these many contradictions and many impulses and many inputs. And I was really nervous with Jefferson because I felt like mm, if I don't find the right Caitlin, half of the show is uh, compromised. Uh, and, and I have to be honest, the gods of cinema are, are always behind the door because they help me all the time. In fact, I, I, I was receiving a lot of tapes uh, uh, sent to me by the great Carmen Cuba, the casting director of this show and of many other great things. And, and, and I was like receiving floods and floods of tapes and, and somehow they weren't focused uh, uh, for me because they, they, you had only part of what I, we needed, but not the whole. And then I saw the tape of Jordan. And, and Jordan is a girl that uh, before she acted in this, she was uh, a, a, a teenager of Atlanta. And, and at the same time, she was a, a singer, but she never acted. And I saw this tape in which she was uh, uh, auditioned for the role uh, playing the David Mamet uh, scene. And it, she was incredible. I suddenly said, oh my God, that's Caitlin. And I was terrified once I saw that, that somehow she was great only in that scene. So I said, let's tape more. And she taped many other scenes and she was just perfection. So I flew to Los Angeles at the time in, we, in which we could fly easily from one end, one end of the world and to the other. And I sat with her and I felt that she was a wonderful partner to be with. And, and, then, and, then, and then we saw the beautiful blossoming of a great actress and a great, potentially a great star. And it was great to see how she has been received and what she's doing now. And I'm very, very proud. Yeah, it's an it's in, it's incredible discovery um, for both of you. And um, uh, Luca, can we talk about um, Fraser as well? I mean, he's, he's the composite of so many um, kids I know. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it, it really, uh, you know, he's this hyper intelligent, gifted um, young person who is, um, you know, also troubled, you know, and I think his relationship with his mother is incredibly um, uh, twisted. Um, and I, I, I want you to just do a quick description of his character too for us. It's so interesting to hear you talk about them and bring them Jack has been the first, yes, uh, uh, Frasier, has been the first uh, stroke of paint we, we put on the, on the canvas with Paolo and Francesca. He was the origin of how we intended the, the, this show. We wanted to talk about, we wanted to portray a kid who could be somehow bringing 
at the wisdom of an old person and the excitement of a very young one. We wanted to, to, mm. to portray somebody who could be completely wired and connected with the contemporarity, but at the same time, be extremely knowledgeable and critical of it. Someone somehow that could have been an intellectual, but also an immature kid lost. And uh, we taught a lot of people. Uh, I, as you said, it, the, the Frasier reminds me of a lot of kids that I know and a lot of people that I know. And I have to be honest, uh, I, uh, you know that I have a very beautiful bond with the world of fashion and, and, and the world of fashion we all know here at Nowness that is one of the most compelling and fruitful and rich place for individuality you can find, mm. uh, despite the, uh, uh, let's say, sometimes the constriction of the market, but it still is a place where creativity, individuality, sheer curiosity and feverish approach to life uh, is really one of the places where you can get that. And, 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 and in fact, many people I thought about were coming from that world. Um, and, in, and, and when I spoke to Francesco and, Francesca and Paola, and Paolo, uh, we all agreed that he wasn't someone who was interested in, uh, let's say, um, mm, the codes of fashion for the idea of belonging to anything. He was somehow an intellectual of that, someone who knew that what every sign you bring and carry outside in the world has a meaning that is very much, much more deep that you can expect people to understand in the first place. And, 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 and we wanted him to be also, uh, Fraser, uh, reflecting somehow of the idea of a filmmaker because Fraser wants to control the world, you know, like he mm. wants to control the mothers, he wants to control Caitlin, he wants to control himself and always lose control, which in a way is the Pyrrhic uh, uh, sense of victory that every filmmaker has. You think oh, you're doing so something. interesting. I never thought of that. That's how I see that. And, 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 and again, like for, for Caitlin, it was difficult. You know, how do you encompass that? How do you encompass a kid who is lost about what he desires? What is his identity without stepping necessarily on the tropes or even worse, the cliche of um, the um, way in which gender identity is pushed through the medium uh, and the social media and, and in general, the mainstream. And in fact, in meeting Jack, Jack Grazer was a, a great moment of revelation. I knew Jack already because Jack is a very um, uh, great uh, child actor who played in Beautiful Boy. He played uh, Timothy Chalamet Young. Um, he played in Shazam and he was in It Chapter One and Chapter Two. So I knew already knew that he was a very talented young man. And, and when I saw his tape, uh, he clearly was the best person we could uh, uh, approach to this. And when I started working with him on the set, I met uh, a companion, a real companion. I tell you a little anecdote. Uh, I was talking with uh, Alice and, and, and Chloe about a scene that involved the two characters played by them. Mm -hmm. And Jack was going to be coming later for uh, another scene, but he was uh, hanging there. And I was almost to the point to quote a movie that I love for the scene we were doing, saying to them that what I wanted from them was reflected in a movie from Bernardo Bertolucci. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, Jack says, yeah, yeah, Alice, Chloe, you should think about La Luna by Bernardo Bertolucci. And that's the movie I meant without having said the name already. He knew the movie. He knew what I was referring to. That's Jack. That's incredible. And, and that's the beauty of this generation. It's so it's so interesting um, because you know you, you you made a documentary on Bernardo Bertolucci and obviously yes. you know you had an intimate relationship with him and I think there's this poster of Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris and there's a Klaus Nomi poster but the Bertolucci one really features uh, prominently in in um, in Fraser's teenage bedroom in in the, in the military base and um, you know I wanted to um, it was you. I think you, I've heard you say that Bertolucci told you that you think of cinema through cinema. Is that right? That's something we, dis that's something we discussed a lot with Bernardo, but uh, what's, what's touching is that after I am, Call Me By Your Name came out in theaters and he saw it, he, he made a little uh, piece on variety in which he paralleled his uh, idea of cinema through the lens of cinema and mine and which was very touching that he uh, had uh, 
was so generous to put uh, me in the same uh, uh, place of his. I miss him so much. Yeah, but this is just, you know, just for, um, I, yeah, he, he is, yeah. Um, let's, um, let's pay respect to him through this, um, this uh, promotion of his amazing films as well. Yes. And um, I think what's interesting though, is it's not um, about references, right? So what you're not talking about is referencing cinema in the way that you make cinema. What it is, is about being able to um, talk about cinema through cinema. And I think that's a very different thing. And it'd be interesting to um, ask you for some examples of that in, in this film. I mean, one is the, for me, is the idea of time. Like we're in 2018 and then the movie theater itself plays a very, plays a role in, in, in quite a few episodes. And he's going through the different movie posters of what's out that year. And it's like, I don't know, Hacksaw Ridge and Ouija and, and it's giving, it's using cinema to give a, a sense of time. And then also the idea of, um, you know, and there's many other kind of references in, in the film to. to the, 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 the military base name comes after, it's named the, uh, Caserma Maurizio Pialati, which means base Maurizio Pialati, which is basically my little homage to Maurice Piala, the great filmmaker of Anos Amour, Police uh, and Under the Saturn Sun. Uh, oh, and many of these little movies. Easter egg there. For yes, many of these, these Easter eggs. But the truth is that uh, um, thinking of these adolescents, I was thinking a lot of the adolescents in Bernardo Bertolucci and in Maurice Piala. And those movies helped me understand how to see right. these adolescents. That was really one of the most uh, uh, important ways in which cinema can be made by thinking of cinema. Um, of course, the scene in the movie theater is uh, something very dear to me. Um, and, and, and all the movies you see are the ones that were out that week of that year, which is 2016, the election year of Trump. Right. And, and we made a research, it was, everything is so precise. And I, and, I, and, and I was looking at the posters and I was thinking which one would Fraser choose and what relationship would he have with each of these places, each, each of these movies. And in fact, he does this to Paul Schrader, kisses in the mouth Tom Hanks, which I'm a big fan of, looks twice at Huxley Ridge because he's attracted by the great Andrew Garfield, and nixes another couple of movies and goes for a horror movie because there is nothing better than a night out at the horror movies by, uh, by the way, the great movie we, we just. Well, we know you love horror movies too. I um, do very much. Last time I saw you was at the, at the amazing premiere of Suspiria. Wow. Uh, in Paris and um, I'm coming back to something you just said, which was, you know, the preciseness of that one week of what was out, your research that you did um, to get exactly precisely those, film, those films in the posters, in the cinema that you recreated. Detail is very important for you. It's, it's something that it, it marks you out as a director, your attention to detail, especially in production, in production design and in so many of the kind of um, lo um, locations and action that you put it, storytelling that you put into those locations. Now the military base itself is, is a recreation of a military base, but there's no from scratch. From scratch. Are you kidding yeah. me? You that has been built from scratch because we couldn't that's have- That's insane, Luca. It's, it's completely you. insane. <laughs> it's completely insane. We, had, we, we, we were supposed to be working with the support of the DOD, the Department of Defense, but then they decided not to support us because of the content of the show. I'm going to the roads, the lights, the swimming pool. The, everything was made from scratch. From scratch. That is unbelievable. It has been a, an incredible work by production designer Elio Tostetter and art director Monica Salustio and all the incredible team behind the production, but we found this little lot in the middle of nowhere in the countryside near Padua. And it was a literally, I'm, I'm not kidding, was like two or three little houses and no more. And then fields of soy around us. So we said, let's rent this little one and rent the fields. And we put everything back. We put new housing, new buildings, 
every light, every signpost, every lighting, every greenery, every tree, every vehicles. And then we made all the roads and we made all the signs on the, on the streets. And then we went inside and we created the inside of everything, the refectory, the school, the supermarket. We, we flew boxes of food that was the right food of that year from America to create the supermarket. And all of this has been made. It was maddening and, and the really library, like- The library is- The yeah. library, if you look at the library, uh, that's uh, Alisa, uh, our wonderful Alisa, the, the set decorator. Every book is American and every book is cataloged with the name of the fake library. I know this is something of infantile to, to be proud of this, but I am proud of this because at the end of the day, I mean, when you offer something to an audience, uh, you better respect your audience. And, uh, and when you create something with, with actors, you give them the context in which they can really be uninged yeah. in their performances. And at the same time, I am somehow probably now that I'm almost 50, I can admit that what I am is that I am a craftsmanship, a craftsman. I like to chisel things. I like to do things with my hands. So the, the, I, the pleasure I get from really crafting things is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And the, the, the depth of uh, production design and thinking that has gone into it makes it so compelling to watch. Um, I mean, I want to talk to you about a few things. There's the fashion, there's the music, there's the literature, there's these kind of incredible cultural references throughout the film. So maybe we can... Um, Maybe we can break those down. So let's talk about literature in the film. Yes. Is this well, as important? I, I mean, as important. I said, that Fraser is, is, an, is an ancient person, he's, a, he's, a, he's an intellectual. And for him, um, the thing that is most interesting is the idea of cross references and, and mixing things and finding elements of interest in every element of the real, of reality. But books are very important for him. He reads a lot. We, we, the first book we see him reading is The Wild Boys by William Burroughs. Which is also a nod to um, your to history. me and Tilda. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to our... Uh, um, so we won't novel. go into that, but maybe someone, maybe someone who's watching... We'll, we'll know. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, he goes to Ocean Wong. He, he reads poems of Ocean Wong to Caitlin. Ocean Wong is this uh, incredible writer who debut with this book that he reads in the in the boat of episode three with a poem book and then they discuss with the, his uh, crush uh, Jonathan about the upcoming novel of Ocean Wong um, and, and and you know like books the novel we can all we can all now enjoy because we're in the future exactly that's one of the things that I loved about cinema you can predict the future <laughs> uh, so books are super important also as a way to provoke or to seduce or to um, uh, somehow uh, uh, misplace somebody. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, who is played by Tom Mercier, uh, who is, uh, is, he is um, an Israeli-American uh, soldier who yeah. uh, Frazier develops uh, an attraction that is uh, confused and, and, and morbid until in the seventh episode, there is a, a sort of um, natural outcome of that, that uh, makes him realize that that's not the real thing for him. But during their relationship, Jonathan proposes to Fraser to read a book that is uh, The Kindly Ones, the Jonathan Little uh, success of scandal a few years ago about the Nazi uh, uh, criminal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a Jewish uh, uh, soldier who hands that to uh, a young boy. I believe books can be, uh, um, somehow excitingly dangerous. But when I say that, I don't mean that we should be um, somehow uh, uh, thinking of uh, not allowing books to be spread all over. It's just that from a book, you can find ways of provoking the other and maybe make the other think. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, also the time, I mean, it's incredible the amount of detail and attention to the production design, and then all of this storytelling with literature, fashion, music that happens in the film, and it's 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 the kind of depth that you would expect in a in a feature. But obviously, this is for TV. But then you also have this extended time of having eight episodes in which to 
allow stories to unfold. So, I mean, I just think it's brilliant that you've broken with all the conventions of TV and streaming in the way that youth is, youth is portrayed, the way that um, coming of age is portrayed, the way that um, um, se sexuality and identity and gender nonconformity is often quite parodied in, in, on, on t in TV shows. And the way you've also just brought a kind of poetry to the storytelling, which is super visceral and immersive. It's something so fresh, Luca, for television. It's unbelievable. Oh, thank you. Um, um, tell me, um, tell me, did you think about those conventions when you were going into making this? Were you aware of that? Was it something you deliberately? I, 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 I would say if, if you had asked me this 20 years ago, I would have said yes. But now I am in a position in which I am not more, any more interested in the iconoclasm uh, and in the, let's say, uh, um, trying to subvert a canon. I am more interested in what I'm interested. I'm more interested in what I like. And uh, so what you see in this is a, a reflection of what is really uh, uh, is uh, um, that I like. In but you people. are who you are. You couldn't exactly. do it. <laughs> exactly. This sounds cheesy, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> we are who we are. So fashion, um, it's amazing all the um, fashion references, the the obsession with Raf Simmons, the moment. I'm obsessed with Raf Simmons, as everybody knows. <laughs> so wonderful. And you've now passed that on to Jack and who's, you know, also and also, you know, it is there is a there is a phenomenal cult of Raf Simmons and deservedly so because he is, you know, um, an incredible, an incredible designer. There is, there is a, there is a wonderful uh, um, um, and really almost unexpected in the past ten years rise of knowledge and 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 obsession for many many young kids on um, a core of great menswear yeah. uh, that is Ralph Simmons and Helmut Lang and, and of course uh, uh, Prada. Um, but Balenciaga, uh, now Bottega Veneta, you see that there is a sort of uh, rabid sense of um, understanding of those codes from very unexpected people, people who are not necessarily tied with the idea of fashion we may have. Um, and that's something that I found really interesting and riveting. Um, Raf, for instance, uh, had made this incredible career before getting into Jill Sander, and it was all about the culture of the, the, the youth tribes and the culture of the punk or the post-punk. And already that was a huge legacy. And then everything else arrived and happened. And the fact that he can be crossing both sides of high, high, high fashion and this kind of like incredibly epic sense of uh, the female and, and then being so uh, uh, invested in the in the concept of young culture, it's it's enormous, and and I and and I felt that it was important to 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 talk about it in the show in a in a in a sort of a, a transverse transversal way, but still we did. Yeah, and that intersectionality is really incredible, you know, and how you bring in um, all of that without dumbing it down or reducing it to labels or reducing it to some kind of uh, absolutely. Uh, fetishism of a, of, a, of a kind of consumer culture, but you-, you Absolutely, thank you for this. That's yeah. that, what you said is meaning, it's so meaningful. Thank you, that's great. I wouldn't, I didn't know how to put it. You did it so well, I will use it. Um, now, now, now an even bigger star is, is the music. Um, so please let's spend some time on, 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 on the incredible uh, music. I mean, I, I, as part of my research, I found online a um, track by track breakdown of each episode, which was also um, a beautiful playlist. Um, and uh, tell us your approach to, the, another thing about the music in the film is not just the, the choices of music, but music appears in so many different ways. I mean, there's, it, it appears in every possible way that music I've ever heard appear in a film. Great. I mean, I mean 
Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. That's so, that's so important because it's not that this is about the culture of the kids in the show and the music reflects the age at the time. It's, as you say, a sort of constructions in which you have so many different levels of music that in a way it, they encompass all the possibilities. I, when I do think of music, I draw diagrams. I give a color to a, a usage and a kind of music and and so, and then I see, and I attribute the pieces of music I want to use to that color. And eventually I see how the composition of all the colors behaves. And for we are, we are, it's like a kilted uh, cover with a lot of intersections. The beginning of everything was John Adams uh, musical I was looking at the ceiling and then I saw the sky, which is the first beautiful, urgent uh, sound you hear in the show, mm. in the episode one. Ta -na, ta -na, ta -na. And I always felt I wanted to uh, really uh, empower my work with this great piece of music. And I, and I found in Frasier the possibility. And so from then onward with the Marco Costa, my editor, we worked on that canon, which was this music of John Adams and everything that could in a way be around that. So we built that section, which was our music that was almost like a character that was in a way, let us feel what the show wanted you to feel throughout the lens of these characters, John Adams. We then used this French composer called Henri Dutilleux, which was one of the composers that um, Maurice Piala used a lot. I even found some beautiful pieces from one of the writers that I love the most, Paul Bowles, which was before being a writer, he was a composer. And so we used Paul I mean, Bowles. No, and then we, fantastic. And then we, 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 there was another great composer called Julius Eastman, a black uh, uh, American composer who died in the beginning of the 90s, who has made this very um, antagonistic uh, canon of beautiful music that we use extensively. And during the editing, we knew, we felt we needed some more parts of music that we didn't have. And that's how I called Dev Hines. And I, because I know that Dev, he's not only the great Dev Hines of Blood Orange, a great pop singer, but he's also a great musician. I asked Dev if, if he wanted to add his own voice to the canon of these four authors, John Adams and Dutilleux, Paul Bowles and Julius Eastman, all of them with whom he was completely acquainted and he added these great compositions. Then you had the music for each character, like Frazier, what Frazier listened to. Mm. He's like all, it's like he goes from Kanye West to Ryuchi Sakamoto, uh, pop songs and from Chance the Rapper to Blood Orange. And, 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 and every character could play and show a side of itself. Uh, then we had, of course, the, the, uh, the, the protagonism of Blood Orange in the show and how Blood Orange was uh, um, becoming more and more in the show, the binding glue between uh, Fraser and Caitlin. Well, we'll, come, we'll come to that in, in a minute, but uh, you know, I, I read the New Yorker review as part of the research and they called the music so hip it hurts. I mean, I just find that really lazy journalism. Um, I can't believe they would write that. I mean, Fraser and these kids' world, it is a painful, it is painful being an adolescent. And they're in a particularly, they're going through quite a lot of pain. There's a, there's a death um, that happens in amongst their friend group. Um, I love the use of music in this film. I think it adds an incredible amount of humanity. So when I, when I saw the New Yorker saying, it's so hip, it hurts, I just thought those fucking journalists that just, can't I haven't read that. I should read understand it. <laughs> that you know there is so much soul in 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 an artist like Dev Hines that it's not a choice because it's hip. It's a choice because oh no no I don't know what choice because you can see myself. I don't I don't look hip. I'm not hip. I mean, no. um, but I think I you know I think this kind of lazy lazy critique is um, it, I, I was surprised by the New Yorker. But there's this um, final you know in the final episode music comes, you know, you, you see a performance of, 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 of Dev Hines in the film and 
and then music becomes a kind of a rapture. And um, I really, that, that last piece of music, The Love We Make, um, that song by Prince from the Emancipation album, I mean, it, it absolutely gave me goosebumps. I nearly, I had, I had tears in my eyes for the story, for what was happening to the characters and, and for that use of that music at the end. Um, music is, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, and very emotional use of music all the way through, through, you know, there's scenes when they're like throwing, in, there was a, a scene when, they, when they're all in the swimming pool in that villa and they're kind of getting loaded and, and then they're throwing the pill speaker around in the pool. With, I mean, with David Bowie, uh, Black made, Tie, White Nose, that's it, the album. It, it really made me laugh. Um, and like when they were high, I felt high. And when they were in anger and disbelief, I felt that emotion. I felt there was some very visceral way that you get under our skin, Luca, as a filmmaker. You have a, a voodoo <laughs> as a filmmaker. I don't know, but thank you. Um, can we talk about the use of slow motion and let's say um, freeze frame which is so interesting how you use those things quite sparingly, but also, you know, the slow motion, suddenly those fight scenes or dance scenes look like Renaissance paintings. You know, it's, it's unbelievable what it does. I, 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 I was thinking when you said about the slow motion that, that honestly, I wanted to use it as a painterly tool. And you said it, that it looks like a painter mm. paintings. It's true. Um, I, I mean, it's one of the uh, excitement of my work is to try to understand the form every time I do something and how to use form and how to try new things um, or to use, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, the language or tools of the language in ways in which I never experimented or I never saw experimented probably. So uh, the slow motion, has been decided on the set. Every time I wanted to, let's say, paint the movement of these mm. kids, I had used that uh, deliberately while shooting. On the Fritz frame, I was working in the editing room with Marco and I remember uh, it's the first time I decided to use it is when uh, Fraser drinks the wine and then dances like wild around the dressmaker. And I said, I feel like, I feel like this is so like, overwhelming and painful what he's going through, then maybe we should give him a little bit of rest. Can you freeze for a moment? And he froze him like that. It was an urge for me to let Fraser rest a moment. And, and, and so from that intuition onward, we identified spotted moments and places in which there was something about the moment, about the character, about the, the character's interaction that could have somehow by pausing for a moment, allow us to kind of um, be more intimate with them and let us understand a little bit more of, the, of that moment that otherwise would have been gone, probably, maybe unnoticed. Um, and there are also um, the usage of, I, I, I played for the first time in my work with the idea of, of pictures, not motion pictures, yeah. but pictures. <laughs> Of like talking. to have pictures instead of a moment of like of live action to, to to see how to use those pictures to be expressive like at the beginning of the eight episodes when caitlin uh, after the uh, uh, sad uh, seventh episode she goes to, to buy pizza just for clarity they're photographs not freeze frames it, when yeah sometimes you it's freeze frames and sometimes it's photograph yeah. i that when I wanted to make that, I said to my crew, today, no camera, give me a, no, no video camera, give me a camera. And we were making yeah, yeah, pictures. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was, I mean, I have to be honest. That's uh, like, H, that's HBO, like, HBO, that's... HBO was amazing because imagine HBO received the footage and instead of footage, they, she, they received 3,000 pictures. <laughs> they didn't say anything. They say, oh, great, fine. <laughs> that's great. That is, that is incredible. But, you know, the way it works in the film is mind-blowing. And, um, you know, you keep surprising us with what you're doing with the camera. The camera's dancing, then it's photography, then it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, then it turns upside down at one point in the, in the, in, in the, 
in the uh, at the gig. In the and concert. Unbelievable. Um, I, uh, I've got, we're, we're running out of time and I've got so much that I want to talk to you about. But you know, I think we should give a shout out to, to some of the other characters very quickly. I mean, Brittany, um, Francesca Scorsese is, is phenomenal in that part. Amazing. Um, and, and, there's, and, and, and many of the other um, actors get a lot more screen time than you might think at the beginning. You know, we, we, we kind of think this is really going to be led and driven by, by, by the characters of, of Caitlin and Fraser, but really we get a lot of time with the others and we see their transformations. And I think that's one of the real uh, powers of this, that we're not, we're not just treated as secondary, superficial characters that are just propping up the main ones, but you kind of get something from your relationship with them. Um, it must have been a great, uh, uh, an, a, a sad rap party for a lot of those young people, having made probably what is one of their. The, the, the beauty of, of 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 the process was that everyone came from many different grounds, and they all gathered in Italy, and they all became friends. So you, as you see on screen, was mirrored in real life, and and I think they stayed friends. They're gonna be friends for life for sure. You get that feeling from watching it that this isn't that this isn't your normal kind of uh, group of people getting together to make a film, but there's something unique and special there, and I think that's part of your magic too, Luca. I've seen yeah. I've seen how you kind of provide that space for people to become the you know the the best versions of themselves when they're working with you. You really have that kind of uh, grace as a director. Um, and I I wanted to ask you, it's the tenth year anniversary of Nowness. So I wanted to take you back. And I've always been there. I've always been there with Nowness. Thank so you. I am, I am a member of the family, proudly so. I mean, family can be hellish, but to be part of this family is great. And I want to be part of the family forever, so. Oh, thank you. And I, and I, and I feel the same with everybody um, who's joined on this call as well. You are all part of the extended family of Nowness by virtue of you, of you being here with, with me and Luca today. You know, there are, there are no perfect strangers. And by no. you participating in this you, and, and now in this, you are part of our family. So thank you for joining us on this call, uh, on, this, on this Zoom chat and on our anniversary. And um, I wanted to say to you, 10 years ago when Nowness was born, do you remember what you were doing a decade ago? Yes, uh, it was 2010. November 2010. And uh, I think I was promoting uh, I Am Love. I think uh, you're right, yeah. I must have been someplace in New York or LA doing uh, interviews. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what I can remember of that moment. I, had, that I was around in, in LA or New York, certainly with Tilda and, uh, um, and with... Uh, with uh, um, with the movie, with I Am Love, yes. So there must be a 10 year anniversary moment for I Am Love then. Well, the movie was out uh, in Venezia in, 29, in 20, 2009, so it's 11 year. It's 11 let, years. Let's yeah. wait for the 30th anniversary. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you've got so much, I mean, so much has happened to you in a decade and now it's like unbelievable when I read about all the things that you've got. Um, coming out or, or that your, 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 your name appears against. I mean, there's obviously, we're, we're all excited by Call Me By Your Name, the next iteration. Is that Find Me? Does it have the same title as the book or? I don't know if this is gonna be the title of the book. I, I was thinking of something like Once More as the second chapter. But how do you, like, how do you find the title Once More? I think it's got all, all, all of, I think it's gripping. I gripping. think. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's very, very good as a title once more. Um, Great, because that's what I'm thinking. And um, and then there's Scarface remake, which is a, something. It's not a remake, honestly, because no, Scarface can, is yeah. a, such yeah. an archetypical story and something that has been, in a way, uh, uh, somehow signing the century from Howard Hawks through Brian De Palma and Oliver Stone. Scarface is a myth and is an archetype. So I, I'm more interested in, in finding a new expression for this archetype for our generation than remaking anything. 
Um, uh, and uh, it's exciting the work with this because it's a great producer, Dylan Clark, a great script from the Coen brothers and, and great studio, Universal. And so I'm really, really, really gripped by the idea of this very much. Is it a contemporary story? Is it yeah. a myth set today? Yeah, I can only say that, no more. <laughs> Amazing. And Brideshead Revisited. Uh, that's uh, something that came out on the press, but also about that I cannot say much. Actually, nothing. But it's a it, gossip it, on the press. It's gossip. Okay. It's a gossip on the press. All right. For well, now. wealth of exciting new projects for us to look forward to. And for anybody who hasn't watched all eight episodes of We Are Who We Are, please, it's a must. You need to do that. And when you finish that, watch I Am Love for the 11 year anniversary of I Am Love. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank Luca, you. It's been amazing talking to you. Thank you for sharing the time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, buon compleanno, Naunes. Happy birthday, Naunes. Thank you so Thank much. You. Ciao. Ciao, Jefferson. Yeah.